All right, welcome to Bet the Edge. I'm Jay Crouch here with Drew Dinsick, as always, recording. Uh, what day is it, Drew? It's Tuesday. Tuesday late <laughs> afternoon. Uh, left the right up is down after Monday night's um, epic NBA slate, which we'll get into. We'll also talk uh, some puck, uh, talk about the Stanley Cup outright and the conference markets. Then we'll close a little NFL draft. But uh, what did you make of Monday night, Drew, and the association? Uh, best night of playoff basketball in how many years? <laughs> that was... I don't remember. Oof, man, what a doubleheader. Uh, the fact that both the Knicks game and the Lakers game uh, were just such dramatic and poetic endings I thought was pretty special. Uh, and going to remember that one for a while. And I think ultimately, um, like, the the more unbelievable was certainly the Knicks. Um, like, as again, as a big Knicks guy, <laughs> the Knicks were, when they were down four and Kyle, you know, they, they, they don't get up a good shot. Kyle Lowry gets fouled. He's going to the line. I basically threw my phone. I'm like, I can't believe they donked this one. I thought this one was going to be the, the gimme. Uh, but no, uh, they had, uh, different plans. This is Knicks team that does not ever give up. Uh, and ultimately I think the belly aching about the foul calls and the, you know, not calling a timeout, all that I felt like was marginal, you know, and, and and, uh, you know, I, I didn't have take huge uh, exception to it. I thought the overall, like over the balance of the game, I thought the Sixers were getting a very favorable whistle. So I kind of didn't really have much sympathy for them, uh, you know, uh, belly aching at the end. But whatever the case is, uh, it was very, very cool to see uh, the hustle and sort of the identity of the Knicks specifically get them across the finish line in that game where, um, you know, at times in the fourth quarter, they looked like clearly the better team. And uh, and so it, it was. Uh, it was somewhat of a, a deep sigh, and uh, you know, a healthy, um, um, re- you know, sigh of relief, I guess. Um, and then the Nuggets Lakers felt like you could feel like that one was coming for most of the fourth quarter. The way that uh, the Lakers were unable to really kind of put their foot on their throats and uh, score enough to create enough separation that the Nuggets just packed it in. Um, you leave the Nuggets hanging around and you make it a game where you have to execute in the cl- in the clutch. That is a problem if you have the defensive um, kind of me- you know, mechanical uh, you know uh, organization that the Lakers do defensively against the Nuggets specifically in crunch time. Uh, and I think... Um, that was a huge, huge red flag coming into the series about the Lakers ultimately winning games and being competitive. Uh, and it, you know, it reared its head in aggressive fashion in that final two minutes. Uh, it say it seemed like at moments, uh, you know, LeBron was going to be able to just will them across the finish line, but, um, you know, he had wide open look that would ice the game. Doesn't, you know, clearly hits back rim. Uh, and, uh, and then the Jamal Murray shot over Anthony Davis was amazing. And it kind of, you know, revealed the two key weaknesses for the Lakers in the series. Number one, the supporting cast is just not nearly good enough to keep up with uh, a, a team that's as complete, particularly a starting five and closing five that's as complete as what the Nuggets are playing with. Uh, and uh, just in general, uh, the crunch time defense is, is a huge issue. The Nuggets are going to be able to get whatever they want to in a close game against this Lakers team. And so the Lakers kind of only chance, I think, of getting and salvaging a win and, and making even making this a series is going to be uh, they can't just win game three, Jay. They have to, like, blow them out <laughs> and, like, get them to quit, get them to throw up the white flag. Uh, and pack it in, and I, you know, maybe that'll happen. But uh, at this point, I, I don't know that uh, there's a huge margin of difference between these two teams. And if it comes down to the uh, you know final throws of the game, then uh, the Lakers are in deep, deep trouble. Yeah, Nuggets are one and a half point favorites in Game Three in Los Angeles, um, close to open mm-hmm. anyway. So, I mean, it's it's odds on that the Lakers will get at least one of these two, but you know, firmly odds against that they're going to go. Two and two, so I mean, the series feels uh, this. This feels like the most set in stone five game series win um, that you've, you'll have in a while, um, which would make sense given that you know games three and four are both going to be close to pick, and then the Nuggets are going to be seven and a half point favorites or whatever uh, again in game five. I do think the the one thing I would take out of this series, which I think is now pretty over for the Lakers in terms of their chances of winning it, given they're now plus 850 in the market and the Nuggets are minus 1,600. I do think this Nuggets team just isn't as good as last year. Uh, And I think that's... There was some shooting variance in game two that went the Lakers' favor from three. But, I mean, the Nuggets are giving minutes to, like, Justin Holiday and Peyton Watson and Reggie Jackson. And those minutes were going to Bruce Brown last year. And Bruce Brown is a much better player than all of those guys. And they, the last year, the Nuggets were able to play 
you know, effectively a seven-man rotation with a little Jeff Green sprinkled in as the eighth guy. And this year it just doesn't, I think the benches are just a bit more unreliable and it's a little bit of a red flag that they've gone down 20 and gone down 12 in back-to-back games against the Lakers team, which is good, but um, the Nuggets should have tougher uh, matchups going forward. So that would be my takeaway out of that. I don't think there's really anything actionable. I just wouldn't really have much interest in the Nuggets um, at current price because to win the West because whoever they match up out of Minnesota and Phoenix is, I think it's going to be tougher than the Lakers. And then they've got, you know, potentially, you know, likely one of Oklahoma City, the Clippers or Dallas waiting um, in the conference finals. And I think whoever gets there out of those teams will be better than the Lakers too. Um, let's go to... Sixers Knicks, which um, was about as memorable a first round playoff game as I can remember um, in game two. Uh, what do you make of this one with the Sixers down 2 0 and four and a half point favorites in game three on Thursday? Well, uh, I didn't fancy their chances of really getting this uh, game to uh, I, I didn't fancy it being as competitive as it was. Uh, and I thought the Sixers in general with uh, Maxi's, you know, questionable tag because of illness and uh, just a one day turnaround for a beat. I thought they were drawing dead effectively yesterday, but uh, boy, they played great. Uh, and honestly, the some of the um, there were moments during that game where you're like, wait, is Josh Hart the best? Nick, what? <laughs> how did that? Sound? How did this happen? Uh, and Jalen Brunson is certainly not uh, giving us, high, you know, what we saw from him as far as like a top five NBA player this regular season. I'm not seeing it in the playoffs yet, uh, and that's kind of weird because it's it's almost like schematically Nick Nurse had this ace, you know, this ace up his sleeve of how he was going to uh, basically try to disrupt Jalen Brunson with players kind of coming up behind him as opposed to fronting him defensively, and it seems to be working really, really well to keep him, um, you know, from anything efficient offensively and i think the knicks uh have some adjustments they can make to try to uh you know s- you know just in general um salvage his offensive performances in this series and nothing that i'm seeing from Embiid right now looks like this is a guy that can go 40 minutes and be an mvp difference maker um night in night out particularly as we go deeper into the series the fact that he's played as much as he has on back-to-back nights and you have zero wins for it is a problem uh, and I think this problem series probably ends in five games. Uh, however, if it goes six or seven, just on the gravity of uh, Embiid being as kind of dynamic as he is and, and just in general, um, you know, taking longer for the Knicks to find their kind of more fluid offense, then, then maybe this is a six or seven game series. But uh, feeling pretty comfortable and pretty happy with the Knicks position at this moment and uh, somewhat lucky, I suppose, to be here. Yeah, I think through the first two games, the Sixers, their process has been better than the Knicks. And that's not to say that the Knicks don't deserve to have won these games. I don't think they really deserve to win game two. I think game one, um, you can make the case that they did just with how dominant they were with their offensive rebounding and in transition. But I think the the key to me and what this series kind of turns on outside of the obvious point of Embiid's health is like what, what Jalen Brunson is going to show up the rest of the way because... He's shot 29% from the field on really high volume to date, and the Knicks are somehow up to nothing. Uh, And if he just regresses back to what you would expect, which is like in the regular season this year, it was a top three or four offensive player in the league, then with the condition that Embiid is in, the Knicks should just win this series, not necessarily comfortably, but the average outcome should be the Knicks winning in, I would think, five games. Uh, given that they should, you know, in theory, split the next two and then be material favourites in Game 5 at home. But with Brunson, I thought there was a difference, a stark difference between his Game 1 and Game 2, where Game 1, I thought he was actively very bad. I thought he's taking yeah. bad shots. Shots didn't look like they were ever going to go in. Uh, he was extremely tired in Game 4, and that's actually pull him out mid-fourth quarter to give him a break. In game two, I thought he was better, and I thought that he was taking better shots. He was just missing them, Uh, but I thought the process with Brunson was much better, just getting a bit more comfortable with the zone, getting a bit more comfortable with you know having a guy constantly on his back and figuring out how to get to a spot there. I do think it is a problem that every single possession has to go through him, and they've got Batum on him, and Batum is you know, making it so that Bronson isn't getting the ball until there's like 10 seconds left on the shot clock, just constantly denying him, and it's tiring Bronson out. So I think Brunson will be better going forward, which is a pretty low bar given he's been shooting 29% <laughs> so far. Um, but I think the key is, is just that 
I think that in terms of strategic, I th- just think there are more levers that the Knicks have to pull. And yeah. I think that Nurse has gotten a lot more out of the sixes than Tibbs has gotten out of the Knicks. The Knicks are just doing stupid things. Like uh, the the big guy who's got a really bad knee and can't run, can we go at him uh, when he's on defense a little bit more? Can you make him jump to block a shot to see what he how he lands? Yeah. Like Dante DiVincenzo is the only guy who wants to try Embiid, which is insane. Like Josh Hart, can you just bundle into Embiid and go to the hoop? Like they're just giving him, a, they aren't forcing him to make uh, enough moves on defense. And then Tibbs just like, it's infuriating with, uh, they brought Dante back way too late in game two. And I get that Tibbs mm-hmm. wants to ride the hot hand, ride Deuce McBride. Deuce McBride, if Tyrese Maxey is just going to pick at Jalen Brunson on a switch every time down the floor, Deuce McBride isn't that useful uh, yeah, because yeah. he takes away a lot on offense relative to Dante. So I think it, like with two days, the Knicks should figure out more things to do against the zone, more ways to target Embiid, uh, more ways to like stop Tyrese Maxey having 10 out of 10 games. Uh, and I think it's weird because I think the Knicks are at a bit of a talent deficit, but... I think that they have more levers to pull in the series and expecting that they'll get one out of two in Philly. Yeah. And I, I, if you told me before the series, because I, you know, a price, if you're, if you're, if you're coming up with fares in today's NBA, you should be doing a player level, in my opinion, uh, which means you have to do a decent job of projecting minutes. If you told me Kyle Lowry was going to be a 35 minute a game guy, <laughs> he was going to be out there in some clutch minutes. I think I would have said, what, what, huh, huh? And so, yeah, your point is fair. Like the Sixers are getting more out of what they have currently. Uh, and there are flashing red, fl- red, you know, flashing red signs about the performances of Harris, the health of Embiid, uh, and expecting a second game like that from Maxi this entire series, I think is asking a lot. So, um, I, uh, can't get to four and a half for game three, Jay. Uh, going back to the wall in the old Knicks here. And I think uh, it may ultimately be a better play to just wait for the second half because, you know, with there, you know, you do have a little bit of uh, an incentive for Nick Nurse to literally just dump all of the adjustments into the pot here because you must win game three. Um, but uh, that said, I think. Um, I think the Knicks are the better team still by margin and everything that could have gone wrong for them this series did. And then they're still up to zero. So uh, this feels like um, uh, a decent time to just uh, kind of put this one away. And uh, yeah, I'm going to be back on the Knicks on game three, which I'm going to be on Knicks Island, by the way. So you think uh, I should be like waiting and see how far out this gets before getting involved? Or you think four and a half is going to be the low point? I mean, team underdog going down 2-0 back for game three at home is like the ultimate zigzag spot, um, I think, and that's going to be weighted in. I would just, I think with Embiid's knee, we just have enough of a sample now that I I would be surprised if he is going to get progressively better and healthier as the series goes on. Now we have two games where he starts off, he spends like a quarter and a half looking like MVP Joel Embiid, And then he gets a ton of work done on his knee. uh, And then he just doesn't look like himself at all in the second half. And I'm not sure what exactly the injury mechanic is with that. But like he he's not putting the ball on the floor in fourth quarters. He was just taking jumpers um, in the fourth against the Knicks on Monday night. And it just doesn't seem like he's going to be consistently at full health. uh, And just the nature of that injury and the fact that he keeps on retweaking it. Um, is a concern and I just don't see how he's going to like I would be pretty surprised if he's at five games the rest of the way at full health Joel Embiid the guy that you know was averaging 35 points a game scoring a point a minute and was the MVP favorite early in the season I just don't think that is realistic I wonder if that's almost like a a live betting thing of taking the sixes in the first quarter and the first half and then uh, going against them because that's not something that the market is going to price given that it is so speculative but just like just having watched these games very intently with the amount of money i have on the knicks like he seems to be getting actively he's deteriorating as the game goes on and it's been two games in a row now yeah yeah so okay so uh i'm gonna grab a little knicks then uh at four and a half and uh double down at halftime when they're losing by five. okay <laughs> <laughs> very good uh joel Bay did not have a rebound in the second half yeah. and that is um, Nate Duncan talked about this on Dunked On, but that is, I mean, it's hard to say this is an indictment on Embiid given the physical state that he's in, but 
like you got to box out Hartenstein on that rebounds at the end. Like he just doesn't seem to have it. And that it was it was such a kind of Nixian sequence to win the game as they did, just really? with these like tugs and scrambles and just winning loose balls and skying in for offensive rebounds. And it just that sequence just epitomized that this Knicks team, even though I don't think the process is as good as Philadelphia, I'm not sure their talent level is as high as Philadelphia, but they just play with so much more force. And Kyle Lowry and Nick Batum are very old, and Tobias Harris mm-hmm. doesn't play with force, and Tyrese Maxey is skinny, and Joel Embiid cannot move in these fourth quarters. And you've got these guys in Hartenstein and Hart and Dante, and they're just flying around and they're wreaking havoc. And I think that in a series this messy, I think havoc is ultimately um, going to win out, um, which isn't going out on a limb given the Knicks are minus 500 to win the series now. But um, yeah, the Knicks are in a very good spot. Also in a very good spot, Drew, the Cleveland Cavaliers, yeah. minus 700 to win the series. I would make an argument that game two, Magic Cavs, was perhaps the most irrelevant playoff game of all time. <laughs> Um, just given where it fell on the nightly um, mm-hmm. calendar of sorts. Being, isn't it sure. crazy that Jamal Murray hits a walk-off buzzer beater to more or less end the season of LeBron James and Anthony Davis, and it wasn't even close to the game of the night. And then Magic Cavs has to fall behind <laughs> that in the pecking order as well. Uh, I don't have much to say about this one. Again, feels like Cavs 4-1. Wouldn't be surprised at all if the Magic win game three, but I don't think that they uh have they just there's no path to offense in this series for them yeah i was listening to uh strategy second you know second screen stream that uh nate duncan and, and Danny larue were doing and uh they got into a whole conversation of um are the magic potentially going to be one of the lowest scoring playoff teams of all time right like you had up there total production for this playoff run like how how are they going to stack up and that actually sent me down a whole rabbit hole of like finding out who were the lowest scoring playoff teams of all time, as opposed to just watching the game that was on NBA TV at the time. Uh, and uh, turns out they're probably not going to come close. There were some very bad Pistons teams. And uh, <laughs> and uh, the Pistons, actually, what was really kind of wild is, um, I don't even remember this now in hindsight, but like I think it was the 2009 Cavs swept the Pistons in round one in the 1-8. Uh, the Pistons scored a grand total of something like 300 points. Like we, they were, they were averaging, averaging 80, 80 plus a game, which is insane. Um, and uh, honestly, like uh, it, that is what the, that is what the Magic offense has felt like. I think I would look at this particular series as probably over. It's either going to be a sweeper uh, or Cavs in five. Uh, but I would say that there isn't a clear and obvious adjustment for Mosley to make heading into game three, and that is swapping Isaac for Wendell Carter Jr. Wendell Carter Jr. at least has gravity when it comes to shooting. Uh, and if he, all, you know, if he's out there with your starters, then he's doing more than Jonathan Isaac is offensively. And it kind of doesn't really matter how good your defense is at this point if you're just uh, this incapable of uh, generating offense. So um, when it looked like Suggs went down with the knee, I thought, okay, this one's over. He amazingly fought through it. I don't know if people recognize how um, like kind of incredible that was that he came back into that game because that was that was a nasty injury and he played through it and uh finished the game and tough to say if he's going to be close to 100 percent, but but they need him to be to be competitive uh i think the Cavs probably get this thing done uh in uh in orlando we're looking at a total right now 199 <laughs> this is amazing uh but uh because it's not like the Cavs offense is covering them in glory and um this kind of sent me down another rabbit hole. When was the last time a, a, a playoff team swept their opponents in a four-round series, a four-game series, and then got swept in a four-game series? Because I kind of feel like that's on the menu for for the old uh, Cavaliers. Yes, indeed. I don't think there's a great deal to say about this series. <laughs> uh, I don't think either of these teams are really going anywhere, and I don't think there's really any bet to be made at current prices. Um, just quickly, Wednesday night's NBA slate, uh, Heat at Celtics. Celtics 14 and a half point favorites, total 204 and a half. And then the Pelicans, seven and a half point dogs at the Thunder with a total of 212 and a half. Uh, mm. Any plays on either of these two games? Uh, I have nothing cooking in this Heat Celtics game. Um, if you want to get involved with the Heat out of plus 14 and a half, plus 15, Godspeed. <laughs> they have. Uh, I I mean they can play they can't play any worse than they did on Sunday I don't think 
Um, but you know, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, that said, I, I, the Celtics uh, are exactly as good as advertised in every which way. They're healthy right now. They are. They showed. I thought they showed a gear when they needed to at times in the Heat game one, where it was like, okay, yes, this is. I we, I knew it was here, and you're giving it to us. Like, put it in a bottle, save it up for uh, Eastern Conference Finals. But uh, yeah, I don't think there's a bet to be made there uh, in the night game, though. Um, certainly, the key standout for me in Game One was. Was Oklahoma City's thun- uh, the Oklahoma City Thunder defense, uh, their wings uh, and their bigs in particular being very, very disruptive uh, with the uh, guards for the Pelicans being able to generate easy buckets um, makes that series to me look like a dead nut under series. It's been adjusted down here to 12. I don't think that's enough. Um, and I think ultimately Pelicans being. Uh, you know, slightly more competitive if you get a little bit more of a uh, a little bit of more of a pop. Brandon Ingram, sure, uh, seven and a half is it's a big number, and I, I looked at it. I can't get there, um, but I also think that uh, the Thunder might have gotten their playoff stink right away in Game One, um, and so I'm going to play some under two twelve and uh, some Pelicans team total under just on the uh, off the defensive uh, uh, dominance that you saw from the Wings and the uh, and the Bigs uh, from the Thunder on Sunday. Yeah, the only thing that's really interesting to me about Celtics Heat is just how Eric Spolstra is going to choose to die in terms of what does he think gives the Heat the best chance of pulling off the miracle? Because that's the only thing, like they're going to lose the series, but I think it might be instructive to see what Spolstra tries to do against Boston and because it'll just kind of by inference uh, relay how he thinks the way to beat this team is and that's really the only thing that i think is compelling about the series just in terms of um strategy uh but outside of that i mean they're just on a hiding to nothing like they're minus 175 to get swept uh we haven't played game two yet um mm. and then pelican thunder i agree i think this is going to be more of a learning curve series for the thunder just in terms yeah. of uh adjusting to what is I think of a reasonable defense, um, yeah. particularly when Nance is out there in place of Valence Eunice um, and what Shea can do to combat Herb Jones. Um, but yeah, I don't have a play on the on the series of the game at price. Um, I think that is relatively fair. Yeah. All right. Uh, before we get to the Stanley Cup, the NFL draft kicks off Thursday and we have you covered with our mock drafts, positional rankings, player interviews and news updates around the league. Go to NBCSports.com slash NFL draft today for insight leading into round one and check back throughout the draft for analysis of every pick. All right. Stanley Cup is happening. I mean, some dramatic games to date. The 7-6 in Winnipeg, uh, which is not a score between Yannick Sinner and Carlos Alcaraz, but a uh, hockey score. And then uh, there was the agony and ecstasy of New York sports as in the, the 10 minutes uh, time frame, the Knicks pull off their miraculous victory as the Islanders um, absolutely collapse against the Canes, giving up a three, nothing lead. Can't remember the last hockey playoff game where both teams pulled their goalie um, in the last <laughs> three minutes, <laughs> um, but that uh, that happened, um, and the Islanders are in big trouble now. How much of the uh, NHL playoffs you've been consuming, Drew? Uh, a good amount. Uh, watched mostly the nightcaps because they go on a little bit later than the basketball, which is kind of strange. But okay, uh, the uh, Edmonton Oilers. Uh, boy, did they uh, put on a show yesterday. Loving that team. Um, I'm not a hockey originator, but that series price between the Oilers and the Kings made zero sense to me. Like I couldn't math it with the freaking game one price. I was like, I must be missing something here. So I have, I double down on Oilers, not just future, but this series, I have a pretty decent that I laid the price. Um, so that was a, a huge relief. And then um, been consuming uh, some news and information uh, that we should mention. And I want your take on this because I know you were dialed in on the uh, Canucks, but sounds like uh, goalie Thatcher Demko injured and questionable for the rest of the series. That has to have implications. I don't know that Nashville necessarily is going to be able to claw their way back into uh, be competitive there, but uh, certainly for the long term uh, hopes and dreams of the Canucks being competitive in the uh, West, that's got to matter, right? Yeah, it's massive. Uh, and as far as this series goes against Nashville, to your point, I mean, it definitely moves the needle because uh, Demko is probably going to finish second in the Vesna uh, and is obviously one of their most important players. 
uh, and the downgrade is significant, but they're still one nothing up against the Predators. They're still favourites in the series um, as we're recording. But uh, what it means, and I think what the most compelling thing is in the futures market in the NHL is now, is that like everything is just breaking for Edmonton now yep. in terms of uh, health, in terms of playoff path, in terms of other results going on around them, where they had... You know, basically a miracle on the last day of the season, which pushed Vegas into Dallas's side of the bracket instead of Edmonton's. <laughs> and so Edmonton, uh, who are looking at a path of, you know, having to play the Vegas Golden Knights, uh, who are the defending champions and have this rot of putting guys on long-term injury reserve and then bringing them back in the playoffs every single year. <laughs> uh, I think Mark Stone, who apparently wasn't right to play the final week of the season and then was like third on the team in time on ice in game one against Dallas. Um, it's just one of the great, uh, like a Marcus Smart 500 to one type of rort from Vegas. Uh, but with the Oilers avoiding the Knights and instead getting a relative layup series against the Kings, they were minus 200 to your point, uh, and they take game one. So they're in very good position to get out of round one. Then round two, they're likely going to face the Canucks without their Vesna finalist goalie. And then round three, if you were to rank the teams that Edmonton wouldn't want to play, you would say one and two would be Dallas and Colorado. And as we speak now, Colorado's about to play, but they're both down one nothing in their series. So I would say that Edmonton's most likely opponent in round three is probably now Vegas. Uh, and Edmonton will have home lights in that series, and that was going to be their round one matchup. They now push that yeah. to round three. Edmonton are going to – they'll be able to go through the West – in my opinion, uh, with only having to play one of the four other best teams in the West. So it is really broken for them. I think plus 320 for them to win the West is a good bet. I think that's probably slightly better than the plus 650 to win the Cup just because, what's that, like minus 130 average mm -hmm. price in the Cup. I don't think they'll quite be that because they won't have home ice against any of uh, really, basically any team that comes out of the East realistically. So I think that the West price is a little bit better, but um, I think everything is breaking for your Oilers. Okay. Uh, who out of, you know, just from a matchup standpoint, do you have somebody I should be cheering for or against in the East? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I think the two best teams in the East, perhaps by margin, are Carolina and Florida. Wow. Okay. Uh, and you put the Rangers, I think they're at, slight tier below florida not a great deal but i would order it one canes two panthers three rangers and then bruins leafs as your four and five uh i don't i mean edmonton you could argue edmonton have the highest talent level of any team um but they're not going to have home ice which doesn't matter a ton in hockey but still is you know a little bit of win probability True. um the canes and panthers are the two teams that i would be scared of though i'd rather play anyone else um, I am on the Canes and Panthers, so I'm sorry. I want them to make it there. I would, <laughs> I would absolutely adore a Panthers or Canes v. Oilers uh, Stanley Cup. Um, and I think that is, you know, if I was to choose one team to come out of the West right now, it would be the Oilers. And if I was to choose one team out of the East, it would be Carolina, narrowly over Florida. Um, but it is set up pretty well. And I think the bet uh, at current prices um, is Edmonton. I love it. I love it. I just one funny note. I I gotta think Edmonton, Florida would be the longest travel distance between playoff cities in Stanley Cup Finals history. But I'll uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll do a little bit of digging on that. I mean that's that is a heck that is a trip. <laughs> that, yeah. That's uh that's a long long long, long it, distance. But it is uh, a long yeah. one. Uh, yeah. I was lucky enough. I went to Game Three of the Stanley Cup Finals last year. The Florida uh, home game for them against Vegas. Uh, I was. Uh, heavily on the Panthers. Fortunately, that was the one game um, in the series that they did win. Uh, I had a lot of my stake on the East, which was uh, enough to make me a Panthers fan for life. But um, that stadium is immense. And it's a mixed kind of uh, cadre of people um, in the stadium, but they create a very good atmosphere uh, in Florida. Um, and that Florida team is, there is a, I mean, this is very much, speculative and subjective and i usually prefer to you know rely on things more concrete there's just a certain swagger and toughness about this panthers team that i think might eclipse everyone else in the east i think carolina are probably a slightly better team but just with the way that this panthers team 
Um, their style of play, I think, lends itself extremely well to the playoffs with they're not dependent on the kind of beautiful game stuff that they were uh, when they were winning President's Trophies a couple of years ago. Is a very tough team that is in the image of Matthew Kachuk, who is actually, Drew, he's actually gone past um, Stephen Curry as my favorite athlete to watch in North American sports. Matthew wow. Kachuk. Yeah, he's actually number one. I can't really okay. – he kept on scoring these walk-off uh, winners for me in their run last year. And it's just like there is something that is very difficult to pinpoint about why he is so good. He's not the fastest. He's not the strongest. He's not the most skilled. He is just – he is always on time. Uh, and just his vision, his toughness, the fact that – he likes to scrap and fight, and he's the villain every single time. And he's also just kind of genius level with his passing and vision uh, and his ability to rise in big moments. Uh, and I'm very happy to be cheering for uh, Kachuk and not uh, not against him. So, yeah, big big Matthew Kachuk guy. Also a big IndyCar guy, Drew. Uh, and next stop on the IndyCar series is Barber Motorsports Park in Alabama. The green flag yeah. waves at 1.30 p.m. Eastern, only on NBC and Peacock. All right, from Matthew Kachuk to JJ McCarthy. Uh, I was out here with a little NFL draft chat. Um, JJ has kind of shaped this draft in a way in terms of how he has fluctuated from being a guy who was, you know, fringe of the top 10, probably just outside the top 10. And then, oh, is he actually going to go second? No, he might go fourth or fifth. Uh, and those are where the market is expecting him to go. Those are his two shortest outcomes. Plus 180 to go fourth, plus 240 to go fifth. Um, do you have any sense on where JJ is going to go? Uh, I don't, and it's killing me. Uh, because if you could unlock this one piece of the draft, you would have like 10 really good bets. <laughs> like This is kind of the... A uh, quintessential piece of information here. Um, as we stand currently, there is no liquid market for two anymore. It was uh, up for a little bit this morning, and there was more JJ or excuse me, more Jaden Daniels uh, activity that came through here. Uh, so I don't know if that's telling us that that's a done deal that the Commanders have made a decision or not. But uh, certainly, it is looking more likely that that not that he will be second, uh, the third pick, and the you know this was. Uh, long assumed to just be Patriots are just going to take a quarterback. Don't overthink it. Um, and now today there's wild rumors and speculations that the Giants are in the market to move up into the three, uh, that the Vikings would obviously have interest in the three, and that uh, both of those teams might actually secretly be targeting Drake May, not J.J. McCarthy, when all along everybody who was assuming that a trade-up was happening was penciling in J.J. McCarthy. So um, I don't really know what to believe. This is you know both uh, I, there's no track record of the uh, Patriots organization as currently you know constituted as being truthful um there's there's a long track record of the uh giants as being untruthful uh and there's uh kind of a question mark on exactly what the um you know kind of front office for the vikings is telling anyone and uh whether they're even in the market to trade up or whether they're just trying to accumulate the assets that they needed to keep the guys behind them behind them so um yeah i mean uh, i hate betting on draft props when you're counting on trade uh, I hate betting on draft props when a, the threat of a trade is very real, and both of those things exist in picks three, four, five, six, and seven, and eight. Honestly, like everything from pick uh, three to ten could get, you know, could trade hands. Um, I don't think they all will. I don't think many. I don't think many of them will. But uh, just in general, the threat of that uh, is, you know, sowing chaos into this market and. Um, you know, for what it's worth, 90% of draft betting is information and the last 10% is puzzle solving. And if you don't have the information, then you can't solve the puzzle. And this year there has been very, very little information available from true blue team sources who are telling you the truth. And for those reasons, this is going to be a pretty light draft for me betting wise. Do you have a uh, any strong disagreements with that? No, I don't. It's kind of depressing in a way talking about the draft just because the limits landscape has changed so violently over the past yeah. two, three years. Like this used to be the Wild West in terms of the limits. <laughs> I don't understand why books were taking the limits um, that they were, but I think Paolo Bancaro torpedoed everything. Uh, and mm -hmm. I know that uh, we and a lot of others kind of got our bill on that, but I feel like... 
you really talked everything else. And look, it's still fun to talk about because of the puzzle solving aspect. Um, and it's just fun. Like you have all this information, you have to piece it together and books have to price very difficult markets to price. But it has been a cop out of sorts of like, well, we'll just pay less attention to pricing it if we're going to take max limits to win $500 or whatever, um, as opposed to mm -hmm. substantially more than that in years past. But yeah, on JJ, I don't know. It never made sense that he would go to, and that's kind of fizzled out as you would expect. And I suspect that a lot of this is agent driven. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if he ultimately falls out of the top five. Um, and right now, He's plus 120, over five and a half, under uh, minus 150. I mean, there's lots of people around the league who don't think that he's like significantly better or even better than like Michael Penix. Like, I don't really understand. Someone may love him because of the upside and the tools that they would trade up to four or five. But I mean, when you're when you're making a bet on someone going in a position, counting on a trade from a team that you don't know anything about, like that's always fraught with peril. Uh, and so I would suspect the most likely thing is that he just drops a little bit and then that kind of second tier of teams uh, that need a quarterback like Minnesota and Denver and Vegas, that one of them would probably just grab him um, slightly outside the top 10 or maybe they trade up to eight with Atlanta or something. But yeah, I don't think that he is anywhere close to the lock to go top five that it was being painted as a couple of weeks ago at least. Oh, well, couldn't I agree more strongly on that? And just kind of one final thought, like, um, the big moving piece I think right now is who, who, who makes the choice at three and that pick is almost certainly going, well, assuming that the, the Daniels is not smoke and is real, then pick three is probably going to be Drake May and we just don't know which team. Um, and if it's the Vikings, then JJ McCarthy, he's clearly sliding well out in my opinion. I don't think the giants are just going to take him at six. Um, because then I don't think anyone has a true talent rating of him being this high in the draft as you know, to your point. So, um, yeah, he, I, I think we're kind of sitting here currently looking at a landscape where, uh, the top three are going to be QBs. It's going to be in, you know, in, in, in order as expected. Um, and just who ultimately makes the deal to either the Patriots hold on or make a deal uh, for that third pick will kind of determine, um, you know, whether JJ gets backstopped at 11 or somebody does a small trade up for him or whether he slides a little bit further. Uh, but either way, uh, his prop at five and a half to the over uh, looks like a good bet to me because I, I, yeah, I don't see there being now priority. Uh, for teams to move up into that range to take them. Yep. All right. Take that, JJ. All right. We are done. Don't forget to check <laughs> out NBCSports.com for more information to help you with your wages. Thanks to those watching on the NBC Sports YouTube channel. If you're listening to us in podcast form, please rate and subscribe. Also, a reminder to find all of your favorite NBC Sports shows on Amazon Music. Just head to Amazon.com slash NBC Sports. From Jay Croucher and Drew Dinsick, we'll see you soon.